So this engine right here is a 430 now, a 430 cubic inch Mercury Edsel Lincoln big block V8. And uh, I just got this out of a rocking yard in Connecticut. It is seized up. So we're gonna have to fix it in order to put it in our project car, a 63 Ford. No, these were never originally offered in any Fords except for the Thunderbird from 1959 to 1960, it was an option. And today, I'm just gonna be taking it apart, see if I can't get it turning. Actually, I'll be doing that over many days. And uh, I'll also give you a quick tour of these engines, show you what makes them unique, uh, any interesting little like quirks they have that differentiate them from many other engines on the market and uh, just give some general information on them. So let's get started. I apologize, it's a little backlit. The lighting will improve in uh, just a minute. Uh, first, I just wanna tell you the fiasco I had to get this engine. Uh, let me tell you, I had to have one shipped in and instead of sending me a 430 Mel, they sent me a Lincoln Y block. Your engine has arrived. Psych! That's the wrong engine. Yeah, not every day you accidentally have a Lincoln Y block delivered to your house. But, you know, I was able to return that and then I found this one. Unfortunately, this one was seized up. But I said, well, heck. I'll take it because unfortunately there's not exactly a big supply of these so one of the downsides of this engine is you definitely don't really have much of a choice when it comes to like cores or good engines and that unfortunately definitely a downside so we got our work cut out for us definitely and uh, today let's see if we can't make any of that work happen. So let's start off with a, just a short history of the MAL engines. These are completely different than the FE series of engine. So let's definitely start off by saying that. They're also different than the Super Duty V8s, although they do share a lot of similarities. I believe the only things on these that interchange between the FEs and the MALs are the distributors and the rocker assemblies. Other than that, completely different. You'll notice even the uh, intake and exhaust ports have a different configuration. Exhaust, intake, exhaust, intake, exhaust, intake, exhaust, intake. As opposed to the AFIs, which are different. You'll also notice if I could come over here, it is a deep skirted block. It's a Y block styled engine, which makes them very stout, but very heavy. They were available in 410 cubic inches. That was an Edsel only engine. 383 cubic inches, which I believe was a Mercury only engine. 430 cubic inches, which was used in some Mercuries as an option. Uh, Thunderbirds in 1959 and 1960 as an option, and they were standard on Lincolns. Then they had a 462 cubic inch version that I think debuted in 1966 for the Lincolns. And uh, this engine was produced from 1958 to early 1968 when it was replaced with the 460. Other than its size, this thing shares nothing with the 385 series of engines. That's the 429 and the 460. Although, interestingly enough, like early 460s, it had a crank-driven power steering pump. This one does not have it present. Uh, yes, you can run them without the power steering pump. Um... That's just an interesting feature. You don't see that too often. And I do know 
This one we're not going to run with power steering because this car doesn't have power steering. So I'm not going to bother with that unless we find it impossible to turn in parking lots and such. Now, you do not have to use the crank driven power steering pump. Thunderbirds, I believe, actually had an auxiliary power steering pump that mounted somewhere right here. You had the pump and the reservoir and it was belt driven. But any other application is gonna use that crank driven power steering pump. And again, you don't have to use it. These engines were also known as the Gray Marine 431, which was used in boats and obviously boats have no use for power steering. So you definitely can run them without the power steering. Moving on up from there, one of the first thing that pops out at you is this top mounted fuel pump which is one of the easiest ways to visually distinguish a Mal at a glance. So definitely look for that. Again, I believe this to be an AFI distributor. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong on that one, which I might be. Now comes the intake manifold. This is a big intake manifold and you'll notice it's an open runner style. So it has a valley pan underneath. Now, there are differences in the intake manifolds with the different years. This is a 1958 engine, so it has the 1958 through 6, actually 1958 and 1959 intake manifold. We'll get to that when we start discussing carburetors. And uh, the big difference between the 58 through 59 and the 1961 to 68 intake manifolds is that these are higher. These actually flow better because what happened was when they switched to the suicide door Continentals for the Lincolns, the hood line got lower. So they actually needed to change the intake manifold to clear the lower hood line of the suicide door Continentals. That also resulted in a change of the cylinder heads. So the 58 through 60 cylinder heads are definitely what you want for more power, and the 59 through 50, the 58 and 59 intake manifolds are definitely what you want for power. Now, what about 1960? Well, actually, one more thing I want to mention with the intake manifolds. Notice they're not bolted in, they're held in with these little, I don't know what to call these, bridges, I think. So that's just kind of a unique little feature there. Anyway, what about the 1960 engines? Well, that's when we start discussing carburetors. This one's got a four barrel intake on it. All 58 and 59 metals had a four barrel carburetor. I believe they had either an auto light four barrel or a Holly 1850. I think that was the first use of the Holly 1850. If you find a 1850, an early one, it was very likely a mercury carburetor. The problem was these engines were really gas thirsty. So in 1960, they switched them to a two barrel. Now the thing with the two barrel is they're not bad. Actually horsepower was lower down to I think 315 horsepower, but torque, which is where these engines really shine, was mostly unaffected. So even if you have a two barrel, a 1960 two barrel, that's fine. Then of course, I think for 61, they also had the two barrel with the different heads and different intake. And I want to say they went back to a four barrel, a Carter AFB four barrel to be exact for I think 1963 or 64, I don't remember. So there's your interest in carburetor tidbits, and you certainly have a lot of options then when it comes to carburetors. I'm probably gonna do an 1850 just because they're readily available and they're somewhat, don't wanna say cheap, but they're inexpensive. Now we start talking about heads and exhaust. Uh, these engines, the 58 through 60s, basically have factory cathedral ports. 
you'll see that when I pop the intake manifold off. Uh, yep. I'm gonna have to show you a picture or something for demonstration, but if you take the cylinder heads off of this, you may notice something that differs it from many other engines of the day. Interesting uh, feature it shares with the Chevy W blocks and the GMC V6s. The combustion chamber is actually in the block. The deck is at an angle and the heads are flush. I'll draw a picture of that so you can see uh, what I mean, but effectively the only way to raise compression on these engines is uh, different pistons and such. Although compression really isn't an issue because 1958 engines ran 10 and a half to one compression, I think uh, 1959 dropped it to 10 and a quarter and 1960 was down to 10 to one, but I think they went back up to 10 and a quarter for 61 or 62. So compression on these engines, very good. With that said, I should mention the 1958 engines, which this is, are also the most powerful, rated at 375 horsepower and 485 foot-pounds of torque. Although the Mels never went below uh, 470, 460 something foot-pounds of torque, they did very greatly with horsepower. I think the lowest might have actually been the 1960 engine with like 315. Yeah, that was also the 1961. So definitely uh, do your research before buying one. Whoops. These exhaust manifolds, these are standard Lincoln style exhaust manifolds. Mercury's and Edsel's did have ram horn manifolds, which do look really cool. So definitely look for those, but I don't think they'll fit in a Lincoln. Moving forward once again to engine mounts. Uh, this has a 1958 engine mount, one of the easiest ways to visually distinguish a 1958 engine. The reason being is because it's mounted up here. 1960 through 68 engines have their engine mounts in the middle. In fact, they have them in the exact same location as the straight six, the Windsor engines, the Affies, the 385s, the Cleveland engines, and I think the Y blocks. So I guess uh, Ford wasn't too concerned about the standardization of that until the year after this came out. Interesting. Finally, we're here out back. This is a 1958 engine. And the reason I wanted a 1958 through 60 engine is because 58 through 60s had the exact same bell housing bolt pattern as an AFE engine, meaning this will bolt up to any AFE transmission, be it one of the automatics, be it a T85, a T10, a top loader, you can hook an AFE bell housing up to the back of this engine and it'll fit. That's why I wanted a 58 through 60. Now, uh, when you start getting into the suicide door Continentals, that's when you start getting, uh, they started having different bell housing bolt patterns for some Lincoln only transmissions. And uh, like the long case C6, I believe, for example. So that's when you start running into compatibility issues. But a 58 through 60 takes an FE bell housing.